Rich, I appreciate you taking the time uh, to do this interview. You know, we're trying to look back at individuals' sort of history with ECHO and then their history with the society. Right. Uh, when, you know, how and sort of when did you first sort of bump into the concept of ECHO or become, uh, become aware of it? Well, it, it started a little bit uh, earlier than ECHO. That is, I had been at Johns Hopkins and I worked with Mike Criley and Helen Tausig and looked at the congenital hearts that they had. They were doing biplane angiograms. Mm -hmm. And my job was to draw out 3D, 3D drawings of what these hearts looked like. So I spent two or three summers doing that. And then when I got to, I came to Indiana because that was my family home. I did a year of residency and then I, it was a cardiology fellowship and I wanted to do cardiology so I joined that. Harvey was the head of the cath lab and I'd done all my stuff in the cath lab so I worked with Harvey. And what do you know, he was starting to do echocardiography. And the neat thing for me was that when I had this little ice pick view of the heart, I had already in my head sort of a 3D image of what those hearts were. And it was like magic to me that you could actually decide what you wanted to look at and could see everything. And I was absolutely fascinated. So I was one of the first people that Harvey trained, not the first, but one right. of the first. And uh, that's, you know, that's how I got started. Spent a year with him. And then, then um, you left Harvey and, and what did you do next? Well, I had the choice of either doing something different at Indiana University or leaving. That's what the chief of cardiology told me. <laughs> so, uh, and I, I thought echo was just the greatest thing I'd right. ever seen. So I went to the chief of medicine at Indiana and he got me the opportunity to go to two or three different places, one of which was Stanford. And they were just doing the heart transplants at Stanford. I thought that would be fascinating. So I went out to Stanford. I had a year before I had to go in the Army, and that's what I did. did, did um, when, when you first, so you, you really uh, first started looking at this technology, what did you think about as far as what it should be applied to? In other words, what diagnostic challenges sort of came to mind? Well, the first thing that, that came to mind for me was that it was mitral stenosis. Uh, it was a little magical. People would take their stethoscopes and say, yes, I hear a rumble, or I don't hear right. a rumble, or is this or that. And, uh, and we could tell immediately there either was or was not mitral stenosis. And so that was absolutely fascinating to me and, and uh, didn't always make me popular because some people who had made the pronouncement that there was mitral stenosis turned out to be wrong. The, um what happened with the technologies in your early days? So you started out with pure M-mode, ice pick views of the heart. Where did it go? Well, the first thing, uh, probably my main contribution in the early days was that uh, Harvey and I went to a meeting and we saw that there was a, a contrast that could be put into the heart. Uh, Ray Gramiak had mm -hmm. found that you could inject and make contrast. So we actually didn't know how to find the interventricular septum in those days. It was, the equipment was so primitive that you didn't always see it. Yeah. And we used the uh, contrast to outline the right heart and uh, find the septum. So I did that and Harvey and I worked a lot on quantitating the left ventricle. Uh, then... Uh, but you, you're talking about measurements. Measurements of the left measurements ventricle. And then M mode measurements and then constructing sure. three-dimensional volumes right. out of that. Right. And so then when I went out to, to Stanford, I had an incredible uh, piece of luck in that the Smith Klein Instruments people who made that machine mm -hmm. had moved to Palo Alto. Mm -hmm. And so they loaned me an echo machine uh, for a year and we w showed the people at Stanford how to measure pericardial effusion mm -hmm. and ventricular size. We wrote papers on stroke volume and all that sort of thing and mitral stenosis. Then I was in the Army for a couple of years. By the time I came back, a couple of the companies, uh, partly uh, stimulated by Harvey at Indiana and Walt Henry, mm -hmm. were starting to look at 2D ultrasound. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was a wonderful company in Palo Alto called Varian Instruments. Mm -hmm. And they said, well, we can do the scanning electronically instead of me mechanically and come work with us and we'll build this thing. And they, and they did that. And uh, we had a couple of pieces of equipment in the, in the lab, but then Randy Martin and Harry Rakowski showed up as fellows, and we had this big thing that looked like a freezer. At least. At least a freezer. It was huge. And we had a little tiny room to do our ultrasound in, and the Varian machine was there, and, and um, 
we all started looking at this, especially at valvular disease. Right. Uh, we brought uh, Mike Riley from uh, Southern California to look at hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, we looked at aortic valve disease, congenital aortic valve disease, mitral disease. I think your, one of your first papers was on quantitating mitral stenosis. Mitral stenosis, yeah, basically doing what Walt, Walt Henry had done. That's and, right. and, you know, it was staggering. And I had, I remember, I remember that well. I mean, it was really magical to be yeah. able to look at. I'm sure, I mean, when you first saw the 2D echoes versus your M mode echoes, what did you think? Well, I was struck. I mean, I, I must say the very first time I ever saw a 2D echo was uh, the, uh, the ultrasound machine from Holland. Uh, I had gone to an American Heart Association meeting and a guy named Paul Hugenholtz, mm -hmm. was Josh Ruland's boss, mm -hmm. had this film of a linear array machine and it had, was on a heart. And he, after one of the sessions, he showed that to me and I was just blown away. It was, it was a mitral, he had normal mitral valve and they had mitral sten, uh, stenotic valve. And I said, this is, I, I have to have this, let me have it. He said, well, we'd offered it to Harvey and he didn't think he needed it, so you can have it. And so we got to have that. That is our very first machine. That's, a, that's incredible. The, the, um, as you, I'm going to come back to the society in a second, but as you, uh, and I know that in the last few years you've made, uh, as you always have, tremendous contributions in other areas of medicine and other things. But as you look at, at ECHO today, okay, or as here we are in, the, in, the, uh, in this century, can you, it's, it's mind boggling to me to, to look at the evolution of it and, and look at it. Uh, what's your feelings about the evolution of it and what's your feelings about the impact it has in the care of patients? Well, I, I was trained in the cath lab and, and that was my thing. And when I went to Stanford, I had done more transseptal catheterizations than anybody there. And so I was really trained in sure. cath. And my goal was always to replace the catheter. Mm -hmm. Uh, both the angiography, but also pressure. And I was very lucky, uh, just after you were in the lab, uh, Paul Yock came to, came to me and said, you know, you, you should look at Doppler, that this woman, Liv Hatley, has done these wonderful things. And as a result of the work we did with Liv, and she came over and did a right. sabbatical with us, um, we were able to measure pressure. So with the ability to measure the images and the pressure, we basically have replaced diagnostic catheterization. Now, the cath lab is mainly an angiographic lab now mm -hmm. to look at coronaries and things, but if you want to do any kind of anatomic and pressure measurements, use echo. That's why it's so spectacular. And essentially, we were able to make a real revolution in that, uh, so that now it is the most commonly used uh, imaging technique in cardiology. If, if, you, if you think about um you know, the, the early days of ECHO, and, and you were the uh, second president of the American Society of ECHO. How, you know, what, what, were, what were your thoughts as, as the American Society got going? How did you get active in it? And, um, you know, tell me your reflections on that. Okay, well, well the, of course, everyone's surely commented that the genesis of it was that we were being pressured by the radiologists right. that basically saying we should not do it, that it belonged to them. In the meantime, the people, there were a few people doing it really well in radiology. Ray Gramiak was one of them, mm -hmm. working with Pravin Shah. But in general, the, when the radiologists started to do it, because they had equipment for doing other things like the midline of the head and such, they didn't do it well. And uh, Harvey and I and a lot of others saw how well it could be done. And so we were adamant that, that people who knew the physiology and knew the anatomy are the ones who should do it. And while it was a big struggle, and, and I did it, Harvey did it, uh, Walt did it, we all uh, dealt with radiologists in different ways, but that was the genesis of it, was to try to build up a group of people who wanted to see this field grow in a very uh, excellent way, really. So really, it, so, and it's interesting, because I, you know, I, hadn't, I hadn't thought about that. So you're saying that it was really a... a a group of individuals who were interested in not only seeing the field grow, but grow in quality. Yeah, we had uh, what, what uh, Janice, my wife, used to call the echo gypsies. We would uh, <laughs> go off every weekend, basically, and put on a course someplace. And it was, that's why we were all such close friends. <clears throat> but the idea was to show the really excellent pictures and to push people. 
I, I remember one of my most funny encounters as I went to a meeting in San Francisco and there was this guy who had a bunch of Polaroid pictures and he was showing them to me and I said, well, you could do this better this way and this way, that way better. And he showed him, the same guy showed him to Harvey who said, these are crap. <laughs> it was <laughs> Jamil Tajik and he had just started doing it at the Mayo Clinic and we were both pushing him to, well, you could do this, you could do that, you could do right, better. Right. And the whole idea was to, to help each other do it better. The, the, um, I'll ask you to reflect on two things. One, as you look back again at the developments from where you were in the very early days to where we are now with three-dimensional real-time transesophageal echo and strain and all these sort of things, sort of what's your reflection on that? I mean, you know, is that, you know, it's always, is that something you could have envisioned? I mean, is it... Um, well, it, I mean, I could not envision a lot of the technological advances. Those were because we were very closely allied with and stimulating excellent engineers to mm -hmm. build better equipment. Mm -hmm. But in terms of seeing the physiology, I mean, that's what was what absolutely blew us away. I thought it was so spectacular. Even on the M mode, you could see it, you know, a thousand times a second you were taking a sample and you could see every little jiggle and wiggle that the heart was making and you could interpret that and understand what was going on. So the fact that it's come so far and that you can see all kinds of wonderful physiology and pathophysiology, that's not surprising. I didn't envision it all, right. but we knew it was in there. We just didn't know how to get it out. And it's through the partnership with a lot of the, the companies and the engineers in the companies that kept building better equipment. Uh, I think that, that it, one of the things I do now is have to champion the idea of of physicians working with engineers well, in industry. I was going to ask you that. I mean, you know, you're, you've become the conflict of uh, interest sort of guru of, around the world. And, you know, I mean, this is how progress was made. And it's Absolutely. almost now in academic medical centers and other areas, you can't say hello to somebody in a company. I mean, it, I mean that's where a shame. are we? Yeah, that's a shame. I mean, I think, you know, what you and I did working with the engineers, we'd say, I want to see this better, or I can't do that, or your machine right. doesn't do this. Right. And then they'd go off and find some solution. Well, that solution was their proprietary thing, and we just worked with them to do it. Right. And they, they often paid us by the hour as consultants. Now it's considered if you, if you do that, it's like there's something wrong. And, and I, it, it's, that's absolutely a, a, an incorrect perception. So, I mean, I think we're still, still fighting that a little bit. The world has changed. But the, uh, there, there are so many people now who can advise the companies, and there are so many who actually, physicians who have gone to work with them, that, it, that that's not such a problem anymore. But, the, but, but I think you hit on a key thing, and, and you're, you're really one of the first to talk, I mean, that others have talked about it, but you directly addressed it, that it was really this sort of intertwining of, of the clinician, physician, researcher with the, the engineering staff. I mean, Walter talked about that, that really yeah. led to the advancements. Well, you know, uh, Walter was lucky because he really was an engineer in addition right, to being a physician. Right, right. But um, there was a fellow named Tom Davis who was mm -hmm. the head of Smith Klein Instruments, one of the very first people who did this. He was a physician. He'd gone into it because in GI he thought he could do some things with ultrasound. And he was really the linchpin for Harvey and myself and lots of others to take the word to his company. When these guys say you need to change it, change it and fix it. And, and uh, it's that kind of uh, interaction and continuous, you know, continually working with the ultrasound uh, people, the, the engineers, it was good. I, I got to work with HP very closely. Mm -hmm. I worked with Varian very closely, ATL, virtually all of the companies. And uh, the reason you didn't have to worry about being honest was because if you t told this guy something, next week he was working for the other company. So th you had to be honest with everybody anyway. <laughs> And we would uh, be very much in the up and up with all the companies, but it was in everybody's interest for the equipment to get better and for us to make better diagnoses. The American Society of Echo has grown immensely uh, over our lifetime. It's, it's tremendous. As you look back on, you know, the, and I think the thing that struck us, and we were, again, all of us had a chance to visit and talk about this just recently. As you look back on the impact that not only the technology has in the society, but the relationships have had. What, what's that mean to you? Well, it means an enormous <clears throat> amount. I, I mean, one of the, my uh, longest and best relationship was, has been with uh, 
uh, Kitty Kislow. Kitty uh, was originally Kitty Philly. She mm -hmm. was my sonographer. Uh, we were such good friends that when she and Joe Kislow got married, I got to walk her down the aisle at the Stanford Church. Mm -hmm. uh, we, you know, we've just been terrific friends. Uh, these Echo Gypsies, who were all together, are some of my closest friends. And the interesting thing is, even though we are, as Walter says, we're off in different zip codes, we still maintain very close relationships. And one of the reasons I come back to the ASE, even though I don't do Echo anymore, I'm retired, is I want to see you guys. Right. And so uh, it, it's a strong motivator. So it's a unique, I mean, the, the field is unique and the society is unique, I think, in the sense that it's um, individuals that had a passion for the technology and what it could do and then I think developed a passion for each other. I think you're absolutely right and, and it, it continues. I mean, I, I can tell from the people that I see at this meeting and I was meeting at breakfast this morning and whatever it is, though the, the passion continues, the, the friendships continue, and it is a unique organization in that respect. Well, we, we know, I've said this numerous times, but I'm grateful for what you've personally done and meant to me, and I'm also grateful for what you've meant to the field and the society. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for the interview.